Good afternoon, everyone. We still have a few participants joining in, but I think we have a significant number. So I think we can start with the session today and the part participants can of course join us. So a very good afternoon to everybody once again, and thank you so much for joining in for our panel discussion on the impact of the National Education Policy 2020 on secondary and higher education. So uh, this panel discussion has been organized by the Indo-French Chamber of Commerce, we call it IFKI, and it's under the aegis of the IFKI Higher Education Committee. Today, we have a lot of participants who may not necessarily be familiar with the chamber. So I'd like to take this opportunity just to share a few words on IFKI. So IFKI uh, is a private association, and uh, we are in fact the most active bilateral chamber of commerce. And we're part of the 120 French Chamber Network, which is the CCIFI. And as a French Chamber of Commerce, we promote mutually beneficial trade and economic relations between India and France. So we actually are providing a dynamic platform to about 600 member companies and 5,000 individual members. And this platform enables companies to interact, to exchange ideas, to meet at events, and largely use this platform to promote their business and activities. So coming back to our event and the Higher Education Committee, the Higher Education Committee is, in fact, is one of the most active committees of the chamber. We have about 16 committees, both sectoral and functional. And the Higher Education Committee comprises of 40 educational institutions, which has a mix of French and Indian institutes. Many of them who you will get a chance to hear from today and also interact with later on. So coming to the event today, I'm just going to share a brief flow. We're going to start with a keynote address by Dr. Srirang Altikar. I'll share a few words about him shortly. And after he shares with us the key highlights of the uh, National Education Policy 2020, we will move on to the panel discussion. It will be an engaging discussion followed by a Q&A. And after an hour, say about uh, four, uh, uh, four o'clock, we will be able to break out and have an interactive session wherein the participants who've already received you know, information about the various participating schools can actually get into the breakout rooms on Zoom and interact with the representatives of the various schools. So I will definitely explain that to you once we reach that stage. But I'd now like to introduce Dr. Srirang Altikar. So Professor Dr. Srirang Altikar is the director of Symbiosis Institute of Business Management, Nagpur. He holds a PhD in consumer behavior. He comes with an industry experience of 23 years and he has worked in consulting, advisory, learning and development capacity. And he's also worked with several corporates in various sectors in the FMCG, insurance, manufacturing, chemical, pharmaceutical, and aviation sectors. So Dr. Altikar has a wide perspective and a lot of experience in the industry. And I'm sure he's going to be able to share some wonderful insights on the uh, national education policy, which will all help, which I'm sure is going to help us to understand and engage with the panel in a better way. So Dr. Altikar, without wasting much time, I'd like to pass over to you and uh, you may please take us through the national education policy. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Sapna. Uh, I hope it was me you were talking about. Uh, sometimes, you know, I also sort of forget what I've been doing because I am what probably Sanjay Baru would call today as an accidental academician. You know, after spending 23 years in industry, I came to academics uh, and I've been here for now for the last, uh, what, 15 years. So I guess that makes me pretty ancient, right? Uh, it's, it's been, uh, I have been now associated with the Higher Education Committee for about four years. First, uh, when I was in Noida and now when I'm here in Nagpur. I have also been uh, involved in some way with this policy. So, you know, it, it's really a pleasure for me also to speak upon this because having been part of the deliberative process on quite a few occasions, you know, it's really nice when something you have worked on actually comes to the fore. Before we start, you know, a few disclaimers I would like to give. Uh, I've been told that I have 10 minutes to speak. Uh, it's very difficult for me to speak for 10 minutes. Uh, so please excuse me if I overshoot by a couple of minutes, right? Before I start, uh, let us just look at a little bit of the background in which this policy has been framed. Uh, we always say, you know, the one thing that is constant in life is change. Uh, I disagree with that. 
Uh, I can see Maud smiling over there. She's a very persuasive lady and she's literally, you know, arm twisted me into speaking here. So Maud, hi. And uh, yeah, so uh, we one thing that we always talk about is that change is constant. And I always disagree with that because there's not one thing constant in life. I think there are four. Uh, most of you will agree with me. Change, of course, is one of them. And that's what I'll be talking about. Uh, second is death. Life is not constant, but death is. Third is competition, which is never going to go away. And the fourth is also income tax, which is also not going to go away. And since we are getting into the budget on the 1st of February, I think all of us must be eagerly waiting to see what, brings, what it brings for us. Having said that, the last policy on education, which was then called the National Policy on Education, was made in 1986. Now that's a long, long way back. There were some modifications that were made in 1992. So it's called the 86-92 policy. 34 years was a very, very long time. Very long time for any policy to be there. And if we actually look at it, you know, the world has undergone a sea change in these 34 years. If I talk about just India, we went through the period of liberalization, the world went through the subprime crisis. I think everybody has seen the kind of change that has happened in the world. And what that meant was that education itself per se needed to be changed. The way we look at it, the way we organize it, the way we deliver it, it needed to be changed. We keep talking about industry 4.0, big data, analytics, communications, infrastructure, smart factories, I think it's time to, it was time to talk about smart education. So we had to go from being hard workers, which all of us always were, to smart workers, smart education workers. And I think this was a step in the right direction. It was long, long, long overdue. What we also noticed, and I think all educators, at least in India, were talking about was that the employability quotient in India especially was lacking. We had commerce graduates who did not know how to read balance sheets. We had engineers who did not actually know how to fix a light bulb. Because I'm not go, I don't want to get into those factors as to why it was happening, but it was definitely needed. What was also needed was that because of all this change that was happening, one thing that was completely ignored was the emotional quotient. And what we have seen, especially, is that students today have become fragile mentally. Mental health is an issue. It is something that needs to be tackled. And I think something was lacking in our own education system, which necessitated all this. Government priorities change, national priorities change. So looking at this background, I think it was good that it was brought in when it was brought in. I th in my opinion, it was brought in 15 years too late, but uh, better late than never. And uh, hopefully this will be the first education policy of this century. And I'm sure that looking at the way that uh, change is happening today, especially the last, I think, 10 to 11 months have shown how it can happen, when it can happen, and how rapidly it can happen. I think this has really uh, opened our eyes to a lot of things. And I think this is one of the takeaways for us that should be there from this session is that how do we deal with this change as educators? Now, coming back to this policy, uh, like I said, you know, it was a very participative process. It was a very broad consultative process, which went on for more than a couple of years. It involved multiple stakeholders. There were academicians, professors, uh, administrators, ministry officials, uh, societal stakeholders who were there. I had the privilege of participating in quite a few deliberations, especially on the internationalization of higher education, which has been one of the bedrocks of Symbiasis. Uh, these consultations went on over a long period of time. A draft uh, policy was made. It was put up on the website of the MHRD, of the UGC. Comments were invited, uh, you know, several uh, suggestions were invited. And after taking all these suggestions into account, the broad policy was then laid out. And uh, what is this policy trying to do? If 
you look at what I spoke about in the earlier part, in the first part when I spoke about, there was something that this policy is seeking to do. And what this policy is indeed seeking to do is develop our students holistically. I'll come to that when I talk about uh, the later part in the next few minutes. But basically to try and develop good, mentally strong human beings who are capable of rational thought, who possess compassion, who possess, uh, I would say, courage and resilience, coupled with scientific temper, and without forgetting ethics. So in short, what we are trying to do is produce engaged citizens who will contribute to the national good. And as we say in Symbiosis, Vasudeva Kutumbakam, the world is one family to the global good. So we are hoping that this policy going forward will help us to move to that. So what I am going to talk about today is looking at the time constraint within which I'm speaking. And I'm sure all the other panelists would be wanting to speak and it will be very interesting to listen to them also. And uh, what has happened as far as changes are concerned in school and higher education today, as far as this policy is concerned. Now, let me take you, you back. Uh, most of you who who are there from India will understand how our schooling structure was. So, you know, we had something that was a play school where children one and two years old were sent over there. Then what was followed by a nursery, followed by a kindergarten, then followed by primary school, secondary school, and then you went on to call higher secondary. That was 11th and 12th. And then you went on to college into the higher educational institutions. Now, this was the previous structure where children as young as one and two years of age were put into school. Now, there has been a fundamental change that has happened as far as this policy is concerned. And it, what it has done is it, it has put forward a new pedagogical and curricular structure. I'll come to that very briefly. So what it looks like is that from, there will be no school early on, starting from ages six to eight, class one to two, for two years, we will have what we call a foundational program. That's stage one. Will be followed by the next stage, which we call, which the policy is calling a preparatory program, which is for ages eight to 11, classes three to five. And this will be for three years. So the first part foundation program will be for five years. The preparatory program will be for three followed by the middle level program for ages 11 to 14, which is for classes six to eight. This will again be for three years, followed by secondary level, which is for classes nine to 12 and ages 14 to 18. So instead of just having two stages earlier on, which is from ages six to 16 and 16 to 18. So we had first to 10th and 10 to 12th. We are now going to have four stages, which will be five plus three plus three plus four. Now, major changes. And what is it that this change, this policy is seeking to drive? And I'll just talk a little bit about the curricular aspects which are being built into this. The foundation program, for example, will look at five years of flexible study, multi-level study, play and activity based learning not much of actual academic inputs are going to go into this. This will be followed by the preparatory stage, which is three years of education, which is again based on play, based on discovery, again based on activity, but laying the groundwork across subjects like reading, writing, art, languages, science, mathematics, and so on, right? So if you look at it, there is a gradual moving up the ladder in which in higher education, we also look at, uh, you know, as part of Bloom's taxonomy. But here, I think it's a minor version of that that is being put into play over here. These three years will be followed by the middle level program, which is three years, where we introduce probably science, all the sciences, uh, mathematics, again, little higher level, arts, social sciences, and humanities. And the interesting part is here is where we start to actually start introducing experiential learning. This brings us to the secondary level, which is four years again. So again, it will be four years of multidisciplinary study, building further on the middle level program, 
but of course with greater depth building in elements like critical thinking greater flexibility and student choice so bringing in in even the choice based credit system here probably right so if you look at it this is very loosely sort of modeled on what can be looked at as the ib framework as well so slowly i think we are moving towards more of an international sort of uh, structure i know this was still evolving and i'm sure that going forward it will definitely evolve now what is it that is there for us who are going to admit these students you know into our higher education institutions or our heis you get a much rounded student you get a student who's capable of thinking you get a student who's capable of being creative and who's going to be inquisitive this is something that we will definitely look forward to and this is something that we have always found something was lacking somewhere the students were always good the students were i would always say are always good but something was lacking somewhere and we are hoping that you know this change of course it's not going to happen overnight but this change will come into it and we hope to get much better quality input of students that we can build on in future right going forward let me just talk a little bit about higher education now because uh, looking at time constraints because i can go on and on and on about this but uh, i'm sure other people will then you know take a stick and run after me okay higher education again you know what we were looking at was a very very fragmented system which was operating in silos so you know you got into one thing and you stayed there now this is something that this is policy is seeking to change you know it's uh, trying to avoid uh, you know uh, rigid separation of disciplines early specializations and limited access to you know socio economically deprived classes as we keep calling them limited autonomy for institutions and teachers and i know this is going to bring a lot of smile to people's faces of course with a lot of questions as to how this is actually going to be implemented very few career management uh, practices and policies were laid down research was something that was completely lacking and uh, you know uh, leadership governance was an issue and again for the first time the government accepted that you know we had in place an ineffective regulatory system which was based on something that should have been thrown out of the window a long time back we also are home to large affiliating universities resulting in very low standards of undergraduate education and we see the difference very very starkly like for example if you take uh, pune university right and if it comprise if it you know has jurisdiction over a few districts and you have literally hundreds of uh, colleges which are affiliated to it the standards of education are bound to suffer it is not anybody's fault everybody may not have the same resources that some institutions may have but somewhere this policy is seeking to address that as well where are we trying to move we are trying to move or rather the policy is trying to move towards a higher educational system which will consist of large multidisciplinary universities and colleges the objective is that we should have at least one or near you know in every district uh one point of contention that is here in this policy which uh, i will come to a few views that some other experts have also given on this i've been on several panels as far as this policy is concerned and a lot of them have been unanimous in their views i'll just put across some of them which the panelists can uh, debate upon few further one bone of contention is that uh, the medium of instruction has been proposed to be more in local or indian languages which is something that i personally don't agree with and a lot of my fellow colleagues also don't agree with where what is good is we are moving towards multidisciplinary undergraduate education where you are not rigidly isolated into silos we are looking at revamping the curriculum the pedagogy assessment methodology more student support for you know enhanced student experiences when they are on campus uh, looking at more of faculty development looking more at uh, developing institutional leadership probably you know giving a lot of more focus on research uh, 
reducing the number of regulators. You know, right now, for example, uh, AICTE is, was there. Uh, you had the UGC. So they will function as various arms. And if you look at it, the policy actually looks at four verticals under which there will, uh, which will be there under the umbrella organization, which is the Higher Education Commission of India. So it is also seeking to promote a lot of inclusion for socially deprived classes. The objectives are obviously very clear. You know, the, the move to large multidisciplinary universities, uh, granting autonomy to colleges, targets that are set are that by 2030, there should be at least one multidisciplinary HAI in each district. By 2040, all HAI should become multidisciplinary institutions. The UG degree will again be split. Either you can have a three-year degree or you can have a four-year degree with research. The PhD itself is being revamped so that, you know, if you have a bachelor's with research in your fourth year, without doing a master's, you will be able to enroll for your PhD. But if you have done your three years, then you have to have a master's. So a lot of flexibility is being built into the system. A lot of multiple exit points have to be built into the system through creation of what we are calling an academic credit bank, where you can have your credit stored in the bank leave the system, maybe work for a couple of years, then come back, utilize those credits and come back and complete your degree or complete your education. I think this is a great step. It's also promoting a lot of vocational education, a lot of skill-based education, which I strongly believe is the need of the hour and which was something that I think we had been ignoring for a long time because one thing that at least India definitely needs is a lot of students who will go on to become creators of jobs rather than just seekers of jobs. Now, if this is focused towards that, that will be great. Uh, technology is being sought to be promoted. Uh, for us, you know, one thing that uh, as private universities, we were facing very badly, uh, if I may say. So it was a lot of discrimination between public sector and private sector universities. Now the policy says that all universities will be treated as one. If you are a university, whether you're a deemed university like us, you're a private university, a state university, a central university, it'll be treated as one. Probably more collaborations with international universities will be promoted, especially with institutions of eminence. So, you know, there will be some criteria that uh, the collaborating partner has to be in the top 500 of some international ranking system. So uh, with these safeguards, I think a whole lot of things are being sought to be promoted. Digital education, and uh, I know for sure that, you know, the last 10 to 11 months has taught us more about digital education than we would have ever learned in a lifetime. So I think, you know, some of the things that uh, were envisaged then got telescoped very sharply in the last 10 to 11 months. So there, there are advantages and there are disadvantages in this. Uh, there have been some points, good points about this, which have been pointed out. There have been uh, some concerns that have been uh, established. The move to spend at least 6% of the budget on education and higher education, I think is a very welcome step. Uh, like I said, the importance of English being reduced is a cause of concern because it's still all said and done uh, universal language. Um, I would say as a matter of fact, it would be the largest spoken language in India. So it's a common language and I don't really think, you know, that should be downgraded at all. Skill-based education being uh, promoted is a good step. A lot of focus being given to differently able students to ensure that they also get the benefits of education. Uh, deregulation, again, is a good step, though, of course, the question is who's going to implement this graded autonomy. A point of concern here is that a lot of stress has been laid on teachers. So there is a lot of expectations from teachers, but at the same time, uh, the little concern that we have seen here is that uh, you know training for teachers has not been given the kind of priority that it should have. Uh, again, there are concerns, will assessments be impacted? I mean, there are plenty of things that we can just go on and on and on. But at the end of the day, you know, uh, where does this leave us? We are talking here just about, you know, students who may have crossed from uh, the school I would say the school level to the higher education level, especially at a time, you know, where we are looking at promoting internationalization of education. And I think this is where IFKI and especially the higher education committee can play a very major role 
is encouraging the flow of students from both India to France as well as France to India. So this is something that we are really looking forward to. A lot of our students are more than willing to go at the moment. They are too scared to go, but I'm sure, you know, in the coming months with the vaccines coming in and so on and so forth, uh, like I have been talking to some of uh, my, our colleagues in the higher education committee and uh, our students are ready to go, but uh, they're waiting for the vaccine, right? So uh, let's keep our fingers crossed and we will also, you know, in the future probably look at uh, if we can go in for dual degree systems where we can accept each other's credits. I think this is also very much on the card. So I think this policy has a lot to offer both uh, at the pre higher education level as well as at the higher education level. And I, for myself, you know, uh, am looking forward to what our panelists' thoughts are on this. I have overshot my time as usual. So Maud, so sorry about that. But you know, this is one subject I can go on and on and on. So I'm trying my best to restrict myself. So I will stop here and uh, I will hand it back to either Sapna or Maud, whoever is moderating. and. Uh, I'm here in case you wish to ask anything of. Thank you so much. And thank you again for inviting me. Uh, you know, our admissions process had just started. Uh, we declared the shortlist yesterday. Happy to say that in Symbiosis, we are the only institute which has got higher number of applications than last year. Oh, so we had about 10,000 applications out of which we shortlisted about 2,433 2, yesterday. And the process is on. But, uh, you know, Maud is so persuasive and when she's backed by Neha, it becomes impossible for anybody to say no. All right. So thank you again for asking me to come and speak. Uh, I hope uh, what I've spoken about makes some sense and uh, I will be here if required. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Altikar. Thank you for putting uh, uh, you know, the policy in perspective. And I must say you very simply and clearly have explained the key features and it's going to make the panel discussion that we are going to get into now, you know, much easier for many to understand. So thank you so much for setting up the context. And now I would like to introduce uh, Maud Labars. She's our uh, moderator for the panel session and she would later on introduce the panelists. So I would just like to share a few words um, about um, Maud so that we can take it forward. Actually, Neha was going to um, do the introductions, but I think Neha has had some issue with uh, her Zoom. So the connections have been lost. So I'm going to do the needful. So uh, Maud is there with us uh, today. And Maud is the South Asia Area Manager for Rent School of Business. She's of course based in India and she's an alumni of Rent School of Business also. And she has 17 years of experience in human resource and higher education in Europe, New Zealand and South Asia. She's also the former chairman of the higher ed IFKI Higher Education Committee, which was, you know, the, for the previous last two years. And she's also a regular speaker on topics linked to international opportunities for Indian students in France. So I'd really like to take this opportunity to welcome Maud. And I think it would be appropriate for me at this point also to mention that Maud has played a very important role to initiate uh, uh, the session, to conceptualize it. And I'm sure that uh, she's going to be able to, you know, take us through and conduct a very interactive panel discussion now. So Maud, over to you. And um, I'd like you to take over now. So maybe we can have your camera on. Um, is it, isn't it on already? Yeah, now it's visible. Yeah. I think we just need it for you to speak. Thank you so All much. Right. Over to you. Thank you very much. I want to thank uh, uh, Dr. Alteka for the very insightful uh, uh, introduction he made. Uh, um, uh, I agree with you. The subject is such uh, uh, it's 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 so comprehensive, and uh, the uh, uh, the education new ed educational uh, policy is so ambitious that uh, it is difficult to uh, to put it in a one hour uh, you know uh, session. Uh, so I just want to uh, clarify to uh, the whole. Uh, um, uh, um, you know our, uh, our audience that uh, today we will have to focus on only a few uh, elements. Uh, we were thinking at first um, uh, to build this uh, this session for parents uh, uh, of uh, teenagers uh, who are between the nine or twelve right now, uh, or the students themselves, of course, uh, to make them uh, um, understand what to expect in the next three 
three to five years, let's say, I understood we, we had to extend uh, a little bit uh, uh, in terms of uh, what's going to happen for their board and uh, um, and uh, what to expect also from uh, higher education uh, uh, colleges in India, in France, because we have this uh, 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 variety uh, within our, our committee. Uh, so make them understand uh, what to expect, how to prepare the, the, the best for, uh, you know, the admission in colleges. Uh, and for that, I'd like to introduce the, um, uh, the panelists. Uh, so we have Dr. Christophe Benavoya, who is the director of Aerospace MBA programs, uh, the professor, uh, professor of marketing, head of Aerospace and Mobility Cluster at Toulouse Business School and vice chairman for higher education committee of the Indo-French Chamber of Commerce. He, uh, he graduated from Toulouse Business School, he is an alumni, holds a PhD in marketing from Lyon University. Uh, after 15 years of experience in the industry in consulting uh, in diverse marketing opposition, he became professor of marketing and the director of the um, uh, aerospace MBA programs delivered in Toulouse and in Bangalore, in IAM Bangalore. He's heading the TBS Aerospace Mobility Center of Excellence, covering all training, research and business activities related to uh, this sector. Welcome, Christophe, and thank you for being here. Uh, we have uh, then uh, Professor Ahun uh, K. Pujari. Uh, so um, he's the advisor and professor at Mindha University, Hyderabad. Uh, he has more than 25 years of experience as vice chancellor, dean, head of department, and other administrative positions. He's a former professor and dean of the School of uh, Computer and Information uh, Sciences at the University of Hyderabad, and has been the vice chancellor of the Central University of Rajasthan and the vice chancellor of Sambalpur University, Odisha. Uh, Professor Bujari completed his post-graduation from the Sambalpur University and got his PhD from IIT Kampur. Welcome, Professor. Uh, we have also Nishit Jain, uh, who is the country director in India for uh, GRM, Grenoble Ecole de Management, uh, France. He's an alumni from that school and um, has graduated uh, from the prestigious MIB there. Uh, prior to this, he did his MBA from New Delhi. He studied economics at Ju Delhi University and fashion management at NIFT, NIFT sorry, Delhi. Uh, for more than nearly uh, two de decades, he has been involved in business development activities for education industry uh, in India and Asia. Thank you for being here today, Shit. Uh, and last but not least, uh, uh, the lady. I mean, for once, uh, I'm a lady. I have the privilege to, uh, you know, finish with the ladies. Uh, to start uh, also with them. Uh, so we have Miss Indu Dubé. Um, uh, Mrs. Dubé is, Mrs. Sorry, uh, Dubé is the principal of uh, Nirja Modi School, um, uh, wonderful high school uh, from uh, Jaipur, uh, who has uh, hosted uh, the Campus France uh, local uh, office, so very open to the world. Uh, she's having 27 years of experience in teaching field. She has been associated with the school since the inception. Uh, she has a double master from VHU in geography and education. And uh, that made me start because I think we should start from the high school perspective today. Uh, so Mrs. Mrs. Indu uh, Dubé, are you there? I do believe uh, Mrs. Dubé is there. Just wanted to make sure. Yes, uh, would you mind putting your stuff on the, uh, yeah, you're on mute. Yeah, so I, I'll ask you the question. Um, you are the fund, uh, you know, the uh, uh, you have been in the foundation of Nirja Modi uh, School in Jaipur. It's offering CBSC, CBSC, <coughs> and IB programs all together from kindergarten till 12th. Uh, so you are therefore in the front line to know how fast these ambitious NEP reforms are going to affect students in India. Uh, so we'll focus on the secondary here. Uh, could you uh, throw some light on what has already been implemented uh, from that that reform and what is to be expected for students currently in the 9th to 12th? Um, and, and do you see an increase of interest from parents uh, and their children in the CBC board looking at this NEP uh, implementation versus international curriculums? Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be talking about uh, the new education policy. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll confine myself. Uh, we've already heard a brief of the entire policy. Uh, and which was very well put. So uh, I'll just talk about higher education. Uh, sorry, I'll talk about high school education, and especially uh, the senior classes, which is grades 9 to 12. Uh, so 
uh, I'll begin by, you know, what's already been done, what is already happening in schools. So what's happening in schools is skill subjects have already been introduced. So uh, it's been two years now that uh, schools are offering skill subjects. The bandwidth of this skill subjects is going to increase now. So that's one thing that is there. Art integration is already happening. Sports is already a big time in schools uh, already. Multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary approach is already happening. Uh, you know, uh, schools like ours were always looking at holistic learning for students, and uh, there were a lot of uh, opportunities available for students to uh, uh, for holistic education. But I think with the education policy, it's now going to disseminate down to uh, the remotest place and to all schools in the entire country. So that's the change that will happen. Uh, and then experiential learning. Now, most progressive schools would have experiential learning as a part of their pedagogy, but now it's going to go down to uh, you know all schools. So that's what it is. Now, what do we expect? Uh, What's going to now change, what new is going to happen is flexibility in courses. So now the, the, the rigidity of a science stream and a commerce stream and a humanities stream is going to go away. Multilingualism is something that has been spoken about. We still need to have a lot of clarity on how this will be introduced, uh, local languages, in what form. So there, there's a little work that is required there and more clarity. Vocational uh, courses uh, have already been introduced. Now, uh, talking about coding being introduced in the middle school, coming on to the higher school, uh, that's going to be new. Uh, internships and skill uh, building is going to be new. Uh, computational thinking uh, uh, skills are going to be new. Introduction of subjects like artificial intelligence has already happened, but I think uh, it's now, the, the whole uh, change will happen when all this goes down the entire education system of the country and is available to all. So that's uh, something that uh, we are looking at, new subjects being introduced. Uh, mathematics is going, we've, we've uh, understood that mathematics is going to get greater emphasis, uh, you know, in uh, the policy as it uh, Assessment is going to change. The aim of assessment is going to change. And there's going to shift from, uh, you know, end of the year exam, which is a high stake exam uh, where, uh, you know, it's all about marks and it's all about how you do it, or how you perform on that particular day. So that's going to change and it is going to become more formative in nature rather than summative. Assessments are going to break down into different periods of time and not be uh, happening the way it is. Also, uh, you know, with the board exams being offered, uh, a flexibility in taking exams twice in a year, uh, two times, uh, that's going to be a change that will uh, happen. And also what we see is uh, mathematics and Hindi, they are being offered at two levels. So there's a standard level and there's a basic level. So there's a talk about offering subjects at standard level and basic level so that the students can choose a few subjects to do at that standard level and a uh, few at basic level. Or, uh, so uh, these, this is something that uh, students should expect. Uh, in, but uh, the first change that we are going to see is going to be in 2023. Uh, in terms of board examinations that the children take. So all this time is going to be the preparation for the changes to be brought about stepwise and gradually so uh, that there is clarity with every, all stakeholders, the parents, the students. Uh, th that, that is how it is. Okay, that's very interesting. And uh, having a. And, a, and, a and the second part, and the second part of your question, Maud, is. Yes. Uh, CBSC versus uh, international uh, education, international curriculum. Now, uh, I, I, I have never seen these two vis-a-vis uh, -vis one another. I've always felt that there are merits of both the curriculum. CBSC being the Indian board has greater 
availability and acceptability when it comes to Indian context. Uh, I don't see why uh, international students would want to do CBSC curriculum or CBSC students wanting to do international curriculum. I think it is just going to make CBSC curriculum richer. It's going to make it better. It's going to uh, make students ready for the 21st century. Uh, the skills that are being spoken about, the changes that are being spoken about are going to make the children the ready to uh, prepare for the future. So uh, uh, CBSC is going to be the main curriculum in India. Uh, everything said and done about international curriculum. Uh, and this will make it better. The NEP is going to make it better. Wonderful. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, and so uh, it means still that uh, 2023 is in two years, so uh, it's going to affect uh, those changes. Uh, major changes are going to affect uh, uh, quite many students quickly. So uh, I'd like to take the perspective of an Indian uh, uh, university um, uh, with uh, Dr. Um, sorry, Professor Arun Kepujari. Um, what do you think uh, those uh, reforms uh, uh, are gonna? Do you think those reforms are gonna um, uh, favor uh, in the next uh, three five years more variety in the major choices for for students? Uh, and yeah, that that's what I would like to uh, to ask. Because one of the objective I understood was to uh, um, uh, to. Uh, ensure that there would be uh, more curiosity uh, ingrained in the students because they would have uh, the flexibility to choose uh, beyond those science, commerce, and, uh, and humanities uh, main uh, um, boards. Uh, so do, do you see, uh, Professor uh, Pujari, um, you, do you expect a change here? Um, first of all, good afternoon and thanks afternoon. for giving me an opportunity. And uh, thank you for asking, raising this particular question. And uh, the context is basically people who are ready to enter the university and what are they going to expect and what kind of changes that are there. And no doubt about that, that the NEP 2020 is proposing extremely innovative reforms, which are going to be beneficial. And I'm very precisely and very crisply identify some points and tell you rather than telling in a general one. So the first point which I'm going to tell you in NEP provision is called multiple entry, multiple exit point. Now, when we are talking about a multiple entry, multiple exit, a student is no longer, in case once it is implemented, will no longer be entering a program. And in case <clears throat> he goes out only after the desired length of the time of the program he completes, for example, if it is an engineering, he has to enter and after four years he exits. If it is a BSc, he enters and after three years he exits. And in case for some reason he exits in between, he goes empty hand. Now there are situations when the students join engineering out of peer pressure or family pressure and halfway through they realize that they are not fit for engineering. They think their passion is somewhere else. Their interest is somewhere else. In certain cases, there are people who come from rural background and they feel that if they get a chance to discontinue for some time and again continue later, probably they can attend to their family job something in some time. So NEP 2020 provides you a facility of entering a program, but not entering for the entire duration of the program, but for some time, let's say for one year. Now, what is proposed here is that if you one year you join, complete one year successfully. If you want, you can take a diploma and go away, come back later. If you complete two years or the second year later on, then you get a certificate. And the first one is a certificate, second one is a diploma, and third one is a graduation. You get a degree and go away. Now, but then this is a three year, uh, this is also same thing as that the NEP provides you a facility of a three-year undergraduate program or a four-year undergraduate program. Now, a three-year undergraduate program is of this kind that a person can do it intermittently. Sometimes he goes away. Sometimes he decides not to do anything and get a certificate and satis get satisfied and try another plan. 
And in case, but then it also says very clearly that a four-year BSc program is what is preferable. We'll talk about that later yes. on. Yeah. Now, then the second part of it, and you see the, the power of this. A student can only take a part of this, get a certificate or a diploma of this, and goes away and start another one because he realizes late that he requires some other career. And this is a, such a, and this is, it is not that it is totally brought out of blue. It has been practiced in some of those isolated institutions in the country and have proved to be successful. So now it is becoming policy. And once it is become a policy, people would be able to interest to do it. The second point that I want to tell you, and it is such a powerful uh, recommendation, is it is called Academic Bank of Credit, ABC. And so what is proposed that like a bank where you deposit money and you have a passbook or an account in which you know how much of money is there. So similarly, you will have an academic bank in which any student, any course that he has done and a credit is earned, that credit is registered. So at a given time, a student has accumulated or earned different kind of credits from different source. I mean, please repeat, uh, um, let me repeat again. It can be from a different source. Sometimes it can be from Soyam course. Sometimes it can be from Coursera. Sometimes it is a course he enters in the next door to some place in his, uh, maybe he is in Pune and goes to symbiosis and does a course and then comes to, I am Bangalore and Bangalore and does a course. He accumulates all those course and keeps it in his account. And then a later date, he, he will go to a particular academic institution and show them and say that, look, these are my courses, which I have done. Would you mind recognizing me and giving me a degree? Now you see the power of this flexibility of the student. He chooses whatever courses he does. Among the courses he has done, there may be some courses which are suitable for him to get a diploma, certificate, degree, and he can get that. Now, this kind of recommendations are in NEP 2020, and the country is ready to launch into this. There are questions how it is to be implemented. People are working it out in detail to be implemented. And probably it is not made so much of public because or it is not understood so much the power. But you see, with these two facilities, a student can choose. And the, later on, it says that it should be holistic. It is multidisciplinary. Now, this is happening automatically because a student can take a course and put it in his academic bank of credit, a music course, a French language course, a electrical engineering course, a mathematics course, and accumulates as much as possible. And he is learning. And please see that why it is happening like this. Now, today's country, today's situation in the country is such, and which was not that, according, at least in my generation, that at one given time, if a person is an MBA from an IM, that MBA is taken for granted, that he is a great MBA management student. But today, just having a degree from an institution is not enough. People try to analyze and try to assess how much the student knows, how much that student has acquired, how much of skill it has developed. And if a student is from a lesser known institution, but still developed a skill, he is not left behind today. Now, this gives a scope for him to move around. Now, you see another power of this. A student from a rural area is not exposed to proper technology, proper the city life, may miss out an admission into one of the good institutions in the first year. So first year he does it somewhere nearby college. The reverse is also true. That is, there is a girl student from a tribal com um, community, and the parents are not interested to send the girl student to a capital state capital initial days. So they ask her to do the course in the next door, somewhere nearby. But it doesn't mean that the like earlier cases, it was that if she has joined that course, she has to complete in three years. But now the scope is there after one year, if she does well, she comes out of that with a diploma and goes to another higher institution to get the certificate. Now you see the flexibility of multidisciplinary, flexibility of choosing a career, the flexibility of doing what your passion says, your interest says, and flexibility of realizing that, okay, the track that you have already chosen can be corrected, which was not there earlier, are all provided in NEP 2020. And it is to be only, we have to wait to see, to implement it. Probably the things that are to be implemented in three to five years, these are not included there. Because these are just recommendations and this will take a little bit of more time for us to implement. 
Now let's come to the second part, last part probably, which I have to cover in this point, is that NEP has recommended that a common entrance examination for the university admission throughout. Okay, now this can be debated. Now, it is not a strange thing. All engineering have a common entrance examination. All management has a common entrance examination. Pharmacy has an examination. Law has an examination. So you choose different disciplines. We do have common examination. What we do not have a common examination is for general education, for universities, for BA, BCom, BSc. For that, we did not have a general. Now, what is recommended is that there should be another, probably it is recommended that keeping, retaining the structure of JE or CAT and other things to have yet another examination. But if you are combining all of them in single examination, probably it is, one has to think, but it is probably it is not what intended. It is intended that the university should have an, uh, it, it statement says in NEP that there's an agency called NTA, National Testing Agency, National testing agencies should conduct a common entrance examination for all universities' admission. Wow. So it is essentially trying to see, and please see that, the, why it is important? Now China has a common entrance examination. China, everybody who passes the school has to write only one exam, and that exam will tell whether you are going for engineering, medicine, science, law, anything, literature, and other things. But that exam is of nine, nine hours of duration, and a student has to require to at least prepare for one year, maybe two years to prepare it. In our country, the students prepare it, they, they don't lose any time. They pass out one 12th class and they go for other things. And most of the exam, the maximum duration of an exam is for six hours, that is IIT exam. Mm. And most of the universities conduct an exam of one to two hours. Now, probably this has to be looked into, but then, yes, there is a question that how to conduct for what courses should we discipline-wise common entrance examination or one common entrance? I think I'll stop here because I have given you a lot of things. And then in case any query, I am ready to answer. For this. Oh, but I think yeah, we will come back to you anyway for some more. Uh, I'll have to, uh, to go fast, though. Uh, thank you very much. That, that leads me to, uh, to my next question, because in fact, uh, and that would be for Mrs. Dubé uh, again, in fact, I mean, the, the um, understanding I had from the NEP was that uh, they, they wanted to modify the final boards uh, in secondary in order to crush the culture of coaching for final exam, uh, allowing the verification of main skills, but while allowing also the exploration and time to be concentrated on, on a more uh, soft skill, emotional intelligence, critical thinking, this kind of things. So, um, I understand that the new board uh, could come in 2024. Um, uh, I, I'll ask for maybe uh, for Mrs. Dubé on that on that aspect, and uh, and we'll come back to you, uh, yeah, after if you don't mind. Uh, but that that's a very important point, in fact. So uh, what what you was just saying uh, means that there will still be this um, uh, competition, and in a, in a country that has uh, you know um, uh, already a, a volume uh, of uh, of applications to enter the the universities, uh, that's an important one. So. Uh, which steps are taken to support the, the cultural shift? Let's start with the, um, uh, the uh, uh, secondary board, um, because there will be a change of curriculum, the training of staff. I mean, we're not going to get into so much of, of details, but um, uh, Mrs. Dubé, do you think that, uh, you know, in, in the next two, three years, uh, we will start seeing a, a shift of culture uh, among the students uh, when they're choosing their, their, their boards? and. Mrs. Dubey, are you there? Yes, I'm there, Mom. Yeah, yeah perfect. So, uh, when we talk of coaching, uh, Mom, in uh, India, uh, unfortunately or fortunately, not many students coach for school exams or board exams, what we with, better call it board exams. The coaching culture is basically for the entrance exam. So, how uh, entrance exam is going to change? Uh, will that uh, competitive exam be aligned to school curriculum? Will decide the fate of coaching and students going for coaching. Very few students take coaching for preparing for uh, their board exam. So that is something that we'll have to wait and see how uh, the entrance exam is shaping up. And then, uh, you know, there'll be clarity on coaching. So that's one. 
the other is um, uh, how fast the board will be implemented so the first batch that is going to take exam uh, in, uh, according to the new uh, changes that are being proposed is 2023 Uh, and i think with the way things are headed and uh, the kind of uh, orientation programs and uh, uh, teacher uh, seminars that are happening we are already being a part of it so the communication has already begun with uh, you know uh, the deciphering and the understanding of the nt uh, the roles and responsibilities of all stakeholders the teachers the administration the management of school uh, is happening the schools are gearing up uh, you know in terms of uh, uh, applying for uh, uh, getting new courses uh, into their schools to offer to students so this work has begun and i don't see a challenge in the next two three years for schools to be able uh, to roll it out and uh, to get this started okay that makes sense a any anyway for the whole uh, you know uh, the decade of uh, 2023 to 20 Policy is the decade uh, that has been decided for the entire policy to become operational. So it's it's going to happen in a phased manner, and I think we should all be able to fall in place. Mm. Yeah. yeah, but what what is uh, always a bit uh, scary for parents that are in the uh, at the beginning of a reform is to know how they're going to be uh, eaten, you know. So prepare for that change as is something that uh, I think uh, uh, could uh, uh, is quite important. So we we sh we cannot expect in the next two three years this co coaching culture to uh, to disappear. You don't think so? And especially when we're thinking I, I they might be. I don't see it disappearing. Uh, let's be honest. I don't see it disappearing. Okay. Uh, if its role can be minimal, uh, it, it would be very welcome. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, so I have a. I would like to have the perspective now from a French, uh, you know, a foreign institute uh, uh, on uh, on this reform of the pre-university board. So on the side of a, a foreign university, how is this reform um, uh, viewed uh, by Toulouse Business School, uh, by French universities? I is it welcome, uh, Christophe, uh, or um, uh, how is that likely to change the selection process of an Indian student, according to you? Uh, Uh, so Christophe Binaroya from Toulouse uh, Business School. Thank you, Maud, for for this question. Um, well, actually, I will not, of course, speak on behalf of all French universities that you know uh, encompass very different patterns from public universities and uh, grandes écoles. But, uh, however, from a general perspective, I can tell you that we are uh, warmly welcoming this uh, very ambitious uh, reform. Uh, which um, focus on the uh, multidisciplinary education approach with this critical thinking that you, you, uh, you insist on. Um, the, uh, the general knowledge is, uh, is critical as well for, for the students, uh, you know, willing to undertake some uh, studies abroad. And so this um, undergrad and graduate programs uh, are aiming at, um, give, I mean, th th there will be a higher uh, quality in teaching and research and community engagement. So uh, I see the opportunity to, to thank uh, uh, Dr. Altecor because uh, as you will be part of this new policy, so congrats for that, it's, it's a good thing. Um, I think that um, somehow, uh, It doesn't change much, I would say, in terms of uh, the selection process. Uh, somehow, the, the academic international milestones uh, remain. Uh, I mean, uh, higher higher school diploma equivalent, bachelor degree and master degree. So that's very uh, similar. But um, really, from a foreign university perspective, the the um, and regarding your question about the selection process, I would say it's uh, above all. Um, we will look at the, the full profile of the students. So uh, the grades, the extracurriculars, the civic projects, um, awards, the English uh, level. So for that, won't change much, for instance, for those who are applying uh, for uh, bachelor programs. Nevertheless, uh, based on the discussions we, we have, uh, I think that there will be one critical part uh, that should be taken into account. This is the, uh, you know, the ABC that has been described, this, uh, uh, Credit. Uh, I'm not sure that um, it would be feasible to recognize all of these uh, credits in our institutions. 
So um, probably because I mean there are there is there is a lot of questions about the the what the prerequisites to get these uh, credits to to what extent these uh, credits uh, will be recognized at an international level. Uh, to, to be completely clear, I mean, we have similar systems in, in Europe with the ECTS, and it's not always um, working smoothly in terms of recognition between all the institutions. So th there is a very nice move and we encourage that, but I think there will be still some time before um, institutions uh, here in France and in Europe will be able to fully recognize all of these credits, except it's my just it's an assumption i don't have the, uh, the, the the expertise on this but except if these credits are as well recognized in the frame of international uh, accreditation systems like the the one we all know here the uh, equis acsb umba and so and so on for uh, depending on the education system so that's my insight <laughs> okay wonderful thanks um, I'll maybe take the, uh, the perspective of another uh, uh, foreign university, or French one in this case, uh, with Nishit. Um, um, I mean, in particular, I'd like to, to take the, uh, the fact that we are in an Indo-French uh, chamber, so uh, to speak about the choices of, um, you know, of, of uh, um, uh, destination studies. Uh, so there were an, an unprecedented sorry, increment of Indian students to France, which reached 10,000 uh, in, uh, in 2019. Uh, and and the objective of the French government is to double that number by 2025. So in business school, we believe it large share may come from an increase of bachelor students. So how do you think, Nishit, that uh, these reforms are going to change the current scenario for, for that? Would, would younger profiles be more ready to come to a country like France after such changes? I mean, what, what's your perspective on that? Thank you, Maud, uh, for bringing me in. Uh, I would say, see, NEP has definitely a positive impact on many aspects. And uh, some of those uh, things I would say basically are limit, uh, linked to sustainability. I mean, a lot of courses in sustainability and environment are uh, big in, uh, you know, in French uh, culture. I'm, uh, and I'm, I mean, what you need to also understand is the fact that, you know, I mean, Indo-French relations are going strong. There's a very strong defense, uh, I mean, deal. There's a very large number of uh, French companies uh, coming into India. There are large number of, uh, you know, I mean, high quality exchanges, if you look at, which builds a strong perspective because large number of uh, French schools in India and Indian schools in France are, you know, having great connections. So all of this will have a significant impact on how the students from India are going to France or French students coming to India. And therefore, my sense is I'm not sure if it will double, but there will be significantly increase. And the other important aspect is the credit bank. The credit bank is also something wherein what would happen is that, you know, uh, students will have an opportunity to sort of give, uh, I mean, some courses in India, some courses in France and bachelors. I mean, if I talk about Grenoble in particular, I mean, we have seen a significant increase in bachelors wherein students have done one or two years in India and then coming in for the third year in France. And you know, what is the major role play in that aspect is the global recognition. Because NEP has paved a very strong uh, set of uh, emphasis on international office, which is now going to be mandatory in each institution, which in turn looks at the global recognition of the schools and courses. Thereby, what would happen is, that in order to acquire that global recognition, global orientation and global uh, I mean, knowledge and culture, I think a lot of students will tend to move uh, during their bachelors or for their bachelors or I mean, uh, in the years to come. So that's, I think, uh, one of the important aspects uh, which I feel would uh, happen. And the other aspect that I would like to, I mean, sort of highlight is the purpose and the uh, mindset. Uh, I think it, it, the NEP has uh, paved a strong emphasis on the mindset wherein the parents have also started to look uh, beyond the traditional courses. And unfortunately, given the current context, India does not offer very many con uh, contemporary courses. So I think that will also lead to a lot of people going into, I mean, uh, overseas to look at those courses. I was hearing some of the courses in infrastructure management, courses in green energy, courses in, you know, uh, civil uh, management. So some of these new disciplines, which one didn't hear of in earlier, 
I mean, uh, those will also lead to a significant mobility in the uh, European side. Okay, so I'll, thank I'll rest you. my thank case you. at this point and probably here for the following questions. <laughs> In fact, yes, I'd like to, uh, to come back to Mrs. Dubavis. Uh, um, uh, Nirja Modi, uh, the school uh, um, uh, that you're, you're managing, is, uh, um, has a very strong network that I can, I've been able to, uh, to witness myself uh, in both Indian and international schools of our reputation. Uh, in fact, uh, they were welcoming a delegation of over 100 foreign universities two years ago on the campus during the uh, Yakak Asia uh, annual conference. So, and you, you have, as I said before, the Campus France Japo office with in your walls. Um, therefore, I'm sure you can give us an idea of how other countries and France are welcoming the change of board and if parents may need to be to ready themselves uh, for changes in preparation for admission abroad in the next three years. Uh, so, uh, Maud, uh, so while we are a CGSE school, uh, we've always, uh, you know, may provided our students uh, with all the opportunities that they would require to be able to, uh, you know, transition into universities abroad for those who were willing to travel and go and study abroad. So a lot of our students do apply overseas and uh, they are, uh, you know, all parts of the world. Now, uh, so the basic understanding is always there that, you know, uh, universities abroad are looking at a whole individual. So while marks are important, it's also about who you are. What extra do you bring onto their campus? Uh, what is the other side of you? Which game do you play? Uh, uh, so, so there is there's, there's this whole lot of uh, uh, thing that is required for admissions uh, overseas. Now, uh, I, I'm sure the universities abroad are going to welcome the NEP because that is what they are looking at. They are looking at students who are multidisciplinary. They are students. They are looking at students who and uh, who are critical thinkers, they are looking at problem solvers, students who can look around, figure out a problem and find solutions. So all the 21st century skills are, the, uh, are, are what the universities abroad are looking at. So uh, while I do not have as yet first-hand uh, view of universities understanding of NEP 2020 and what it means for Indian education, but I'm sure they'll get to know, you know, once students who have gone through the NEP changes, they uh, graduate from high schools and they apply abroad, they'll be able to see that this thing change in the applications that they start mm -hmm. to receive. Uh, and I think the parents would also uh, welcome it. There'll be a little uh, struggle because uh, the mindset in it, of Indian parents is still too oriented towards marks and uh, you know, so that, that will mean a little shift and a little parent understanding also. But uh, yes, uh, uh, that, that will happen and universities abroad will welcome, uh, they, they're always welcoming, they welcome them even more. Okay, wonderful. All right, so um, that's, uh, I think, uh, about, uh, enough about the part on, on the secondary. We have very little time for you know, all the subjects we wanted to cover. Uh, so I'll, um, uh, I'll come uh, back to uh, uh, Professor Pujari um, uh, on, on one uh, other aspect and ask, and ask uh, we'll try to not make it more than eight minutes for uh, three more questions, uh, because we have schools that are uh, waiting to interact individually with you. Uh, in the, the field of hospitality, business, and engineering. Uh, so uh, we, we, uh, we have taken a bit uh, uh, of, of a time. Uh, so yeah, if you could, uh, Professor Pujari, um, uh, tell us um, uh, quickly, <laughs> if that's possible, um, what you, you were mentioning about this bachelor in three or four years now. Uh, Bachelor of Engineering is already in four years, but it should include uh, now extracurricular activities or out of curriculum modules. So what does that mean for a Bachelor of Engineering? Uh, would that mean a slight reduction of technical courses to allow space for more holistic le learning? And does that mean that there is a risk of uh, engineers uh, 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 to be less prepared technically for, for the role? Um, or on the contrary, do you think it's going to be uh, appreciated by companies? Um, and, and I'd like to ask also whether you think that BBA become BSC will, will try to move their curriculum to four years instead of three. 
No, um, um, let me say that when they are saying that a three-year course, but their three-year undergraduate program, but preferable that it is four years, that time they are not referring to the engineering degree. They are referring to ah. the general course. Mm -hmm. the, ref the engineering degree is already four years. Yes. So what they are trying to say is that please see, one should not see it in isolation. Please see this. The entire description is that it says that if you're doing an undergraduate program for four years, then you can do one year of master, which was earlier two years of master. So when you do a master with a three year BA undergraduate program, then it becomes three plus two, five years. When you do a master after four year program, then you do it for one year. So four plus one, five years. So you are actually not at a disadvantage. What is happening is that because of a holistic training, because of a multidisciplinary training, because of a monolithic structure of the training, a four year undergraduate program is preferable in place of three years with multiple entry and multiple exit options. Now, let us map that to the engineering, which is not spelled out. Now in engineering we have, but still it is going to refurbish a bit more there, that engineering is four years and followed by a master of five years, two years. If a person is doing a master in engineering, it is today is two years. But if a person does together, then it is going to be for five years. That means he, it is very simple technique. It is not nothing very, um, this thing that any engineering graduate for the fourth year part towards the, towards the last of that, they write a dissertation or a project. Mm. And then they jo join masters, again, they write a dissertation. If they join a PhD, again, they write a dissertation. So you take out the dissertation part and ask them to say that you do some more courses and then complete the dissertation together and you get a master's degree in one year. Okay. Integrated okay. master today in the country is available for five years. Mm -hmm. Okay, that is four plus one. Dual degree is for four plus two, but integrated is still there. And you can you can see that what what is encouraged that it is not necessarily only in engineering, it is in every discipline, a student who has have a very directed objective in the my in mind, then he can do it completely continuously the undergraduate program for four years, does everything there and is ready for a research program or a master's program immediately. In fact, it is going to be also recommended that with an undergraduate program with a good research dissertation may be directly admitted to PhD. So, so, so you see that what is what is trying what is being done here is that if a student is interested in a choosing a career of research, he has a scope. If a student is interested in picking up skills so that he goes into the employment, he has a scope. So this flexibility is providing that it is not that many people are trying to look down upon that why three years is made four years, but it is a power that will provide the student. In fact, the student will get the benefit out of it. And compared to, I can add here that like, for example, Mahindra University. Mahindra University has tie up with um, French universities. And, yes, Central, yes. And there are four years of engineering here and they go for two years of masters in France. Now, you, you, you combine all of them together now that a person from can do a, a course in France and bring the credit back to India and the credit is recognized because it is in, we have an understanding with France universities, the a credit here will be transferred there a person can do something here and something there. A person can save some time to get a master's program because of this. So the flexibility is enormous. And only thing is that a tie-up is required. Now, as far as the internationalization and international thing is concerned, I was just what I told you earlier, the same thing if you add it. Now, let's visualize a person who is interested in learning about Kathak, Kathak dance of India. Now, but then he's doing a master's in computer science in somewhere in maybe Boston University or something. He can always come here and earn the Kathak credits in India in a recognized place, which will be recognized with a tie-up with the Kathak credit goes there. So he gets his degree in the parent university, but he can always come to India to learn Kathak. The same thing will happen here, that our students who are here learning something and the strength of some parties in other university, they tie up. So effortlessly, seamlessly, the collaboration or internationalization will come take place provided NAP 2020 is implemented in its true spirit. The problem is in the implementation also. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Dr. Fujari. In fact, uh, I think you've you been able to, to, uh, to answer this question in a very uh, short manner and, uh, and a very clear manner. So uh, thank you very much for that. Um, so I'll have uh, two more questions just for uh, Christophe and Nishit uh, in regards to, um, uh, in fact, what you just introduced this, uh, um, the uh, implementation of, of double degree of, of uh, transfer of credits between countries. Uh, so, so Christophe, uh, you, your school has a, a strong master program with IM Bangalore in aerospace. Uh, so you are well aware of the challenges and opportunities at bending programs, here, you, uh, including credit transfers. So uh, do you think the NEP policy, uh, though very thorough, um, it's not, as far as I've seen, it's not uh, providing so many details on, on those aspects, but do you think it may hinder or on the contrary, increase interest from university and students in bilateral programs like yours? Yeah, you're, you're right. The uh, yeah, the uh, the NEP policy is not yet providing much details regarding the credit transfers. Nevertheless, as it has been uh, uh, explained just previously by by Mr. Pujari, I, I think that uh, um, as long as there are strong recognition between the uh, the two institutions and its backup with uh, uh, international uh, standards, it's, there is absolutely no issue. So regarding our partner IMB Bangalore, uh, we uh, we consider that. Uh, this national, this new national policy, uh, as we considered as an opportunity for our current joint aerospace MBA program and even beyond. Indeed, the this policy encourages to increase uh, collaboration with uh, Indian educational institutions to widen the international exposure uh, for both uh, teachers and students, and and then contribute to the quality of education and learning. So for for executive programs, vocational training, um, it even enables us to develop uh, probably a tailored programs, for instance, with IMB, we're working on it, to align the content with the, the market needs. Uh, and beyond the very specific aerospace MBA program uh, with IMB, we, we can hence even consider developing credit-based continuous uh, learning courses in uh, or modules in collaboration with uh, our Indian partners on other topics like uh, Alliance University or I am uh, Lucknow, uh, Ahmedabad, uh, and so on. So, yeah, but we we consider that it's a very good opportunity. Wonderful. Okay, I'm I'm considering it as well. Uh, I just hope that all the Indian uh, institution will uh, will think the same, uh, so to ease up the uh, uh, the possibilities. Um, so a nice question today would be uh, we we spoke about sending Indian students abroad, but I think one of the aspect of the NEP is um, is uh, uh, a legitimate interest in increasing inflow of international students to India at higher education level. So my question is for you. Um, so uh, one of the first uh, step that uh, uh, this NEP has uh, implemented and uh, it's happening before the end of the month uh, is uh, that all universities must now have an international office in order to ensure this uh, step will be taken and that uh, international students when they come are getting uh, support. Uh, for French students, what has been the level of interest in India so far according you, to you and what were the main challenges that, they did, that did not allow bigger numbers and do you think the NEP uh, is likely to ensure high level of reciprocity between our two countries in uh, at least exchange or if not, uh, yeah, full degrees? So I, I would say see, the, the, the key word is uh, collaborate, which has been really uh, emphasized by NEP time and again. And in order, if you, uh, I mean, go in deeper down into the collaboration, I think that's what makes the French students attracted to India. Because in order to collaborate, I mean, you need to provide for a, I mean, environment which is far more attractive. And uh, going back to, I mean, uh, said again and again is about the fact that credit transfer, stacking of courses, I mean, and very interestingly, I mean, uh, a policy which has recognized the online courses. So we have in India something called SWAM platform. And today with that SWAM platform, many of the online courses can now be pursued by the university uh, students across different universities in India and will be recognized in India, which means that uh, a lot of French students, because of earlier challenges of semester timelines, which is very different in India and in France in particular, I think now they could still take those courses which are, I mean, uh, clashing with their semester timings in France or India online and get recognized while some courses could be pursued in India. So I think that will uh, put in a significant impetus in going forward in attracting more and more students. Secondly, the French students are very uh, motivated 
uh, or it's there is a very strong culture of innovation and entrepreneurship which sinks in very well by within indian uh, context and thus uh, with the nep uh, laying a stronger emphasis on uh, new age uh, skills the new india skills as we say which is critical thinking ai machine learning uh, digital innovation digital india so on and so forth i think uh, th this would be another attractive uh, feature for fin students to come to india and lastly i would say that uh, earlier i mean uh, there was a little bit uh, limitation in terms of language so i think with a greater population of indian students and indian staff members uh, oriented towards the international side i think a lot of students and uh, people in general will start to appreciate and learn from the french culture with the, is the french food uh, french language uh, french hygiene we, i mean thanks to covid i mean uh, now the hygiene level is at a different level altogether and uh, even uh, the travel ease uh, which would be also provided for because uh, thank to you more in fact because uh, you were the one uh, taking the flag up and high in terms of visa uh, enablement uh, for the students who would like to pursue the internships so i think there will be an automatic uh, i mean uh, relaxation on visa regulations for french students to come and stay longer to pursue a real hands on experience by pursuing an internship which is more legitimate and doable which wasn't true in the earlier context so uh, all in all i think uh, there would be a, i mean a, i mean the mobility which i foresee i mean both ways and uh, obviously it uh, the bigger picture is the indo french relations which i'm sure will go stronger from where they are wonderful that's uh, exciting in fact i would like to see much more of a uh, uh, young french uh, uh, students coming to india and, students, yeah. and professors of course uh, i'd like to say that uh, the um, uh, initiative that uh, i i was leading uh, Uh, towards uh, convincing uh, uh, both the French uh, uh, diplomats and and the uh, Indian government in uh, changing the uh, uh, requirements for visa for interns, it's a uh, yes. higher education uh, uh, committee, committee. or uh, key uh, in initiative, in fact. So uh, okay. yes. <laughs> All right. So that's what also we we uh, we are used uh, uh, for, in fact. So yeah. thank you very much for putting that um, that note. And um, yeah, I, I'm 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 looking forward to see uh, those effects. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for having been able to uh, um, elaborate on on those complex uh, uh, topics uh, in a in a very clear and and uh, uh, fast manner. Uh, I hope it's been useful for the uh, the audience. Um, I'll I'll leave the the stage. now to uh, to uh, Sapna and Neha for the next part of this uh, event and uh, again thank you very much uh, to all our brilliant panelists for for your insights thank you thank you thank you so thank much you. more than thank you again like mod said to each and every one of the participants i think uh, we had a very holistic perspective thanks to the representation we've had on the panel today thank you so much once again and uh, we're really delighted that you could take up this time and we really hope that we can engage for the you know on this topic at some other time so thank you and i think now moving on as we had um, uh, said we do have a q and a session and there were some questions in the chat so more the would you like us to take a few of the questions since uh, some of the participants have asked uh, you know we are running a little late but uh, however you feel uh, we I can I think I mean the the unfortunately the schools are waiting uh, um okay. behind maybe we could uh, address them in uh, directly okay. after the oh. event Sure. Uh, I, I will be present in uh, in the next part uh, myself in uh, uh, in one of the rooms, and I believe some of the panelists as well. So uh, it could be a way of of getting okay, those uh, questions answered. Yes. Yeah, they could ask the question directly in the interview. Yes, I'm really sorry. We we were a bit ambitious with the time. <laughs> That's right. So, Maud, uh, taking it forward, I think there was some. Uh, we've already done an emailer, so we shared with all the participants the brochures of some of the participating schools, so and as well as the website links, so that everybody knows, you know, and has a broad idea as to who they would like to speak with and get more information on. So, I'm going to ask uh, Neha to be able to share the uh, PPT, which has the room numbers. We are going to open the breakout rooms. We are going to, of course, assign the various representatives to their schools. and then if you look at the icon down on the tab below on your zoom you would be able to see the icon and you can click on it and decide to choose which room that you would like to go to so that's what uh, it's that's how it's going to work if anyone has a difficulty please feel free to uh, message privately neha bhakti or uh, myself sapna varma and we'd be happy to guide you 
So we'll just do the needful and ensure that you know all the representatives have firstly been assigned to their rooms. Bhakti, do we have uh, the rooms assigned to all the school representatives first? Uh, yes, all the representatives have been assigned to the school and okay. the rooms are now open. So, so, great. Yeah. So please feel free uh, to the participants. Please join the respective rooms and we are there to assist you and guide you at any stage. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you for all, the, uh, all this. Thank you. If anyone is not able to join a room, just let us know and we can assign you also manually. <laughs> 